Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time to hear your word taught to us. Lord, thank you that you show great mercy on us sinners, blind to our own sin, but still, Lord, you still show mercy upon us. Do this work in us this day that as we hear your word preached and as we receive you in the bread and the wine, that we might be fountains of forgiveness in an unforgiving world. Do this work in us this day by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, if you're joining us, welcome. It is so good to see so many people in here. It has been so long since we felt full and, and, and kind of busting at the seams. It's a, and it's a joy to be uh, starting off Lent with you with a almost full church. Well, if you haven't been able to, uh, to uh, join us in some time, uh, we are going through the, the Gospel of Matthew. We, it was, and we, we started back in, in um, August, and we're taking it all the way through uh, the end of the spring. And we're going to try to touch on or at least have read in church every single verse of this one gospel. And so if you're just now joining us, where, where are we in the story? We're, we're just past the middle, moving towards the end. We're in a part now where we're looking at why is Jesus Christ come? What's he come to do? Is he just a good moral teacher? Is he just coming to give us wisdom? Or could it be something more? And so here we have, if, if you joined us a, a few weeks ago, we heard that, uh, that uh, Jesus Christ told us why he'd come. He had come that he might die and, and the third day be raised again, but that he might die for the sins of, of the whole world and to give salvation to those who follow him. Well, these have incredible implications in our lives. And one of the implications is that a church is formed. And one of the implications of, of a church being formed is that now we've created a new organization where we can really hurt each other, <laughs> where we can really offend each other. We can really, um, and especially within the church where there are these expectations of loving each other, supporting each other. These are the right expectations. But as you know, we are sinners and we will fail each other. And so Matthew, when, he, when he's compiling this uh, gospel, realizes that uh, we need to hear what Jesus has to say on how we live out the implications of following a Savior who died for us by self-sacrifice. And we need to look at the implications of what that means for us in the church, in the church. And so last week we looked at humility how, and how we get humble, which is, of course, rooting our identity and our value and our worth, not in our performance, but in the love of Jesus Christ. And then that makes us humble servants. But then we see Jesus focus on something else. When we fail each other in the church, when we sin against each other, how do we do that? How do we? Well, we know how we do it. How do we heal from it? How do we not let these failures make our body, the church, fall apart? Well, Jesus gives us some, some of very practical things here, which, which we're going to end with, actually. Because where I want to begin is by looking at what um, Peter asks Jesus. Now, some context on this. Um, Peter doesn't think he's really smart. Peter knows he he is right and he's trying to impress Jesus here and he's trying to say all right Jesus well I, I get this whole I get this whole for forgiveness thing right so if you if you'd follow me um, here on uh, verse uh, I believe it's 21 here Peter came to him and said Lord how often do I forgive my brother when he sins against me said seven times now, just so you know, numbers in the Bible are, are very rarely very literal. The, the number seven is a symbolic number. And what, what it means is a generous amount, right? Sort of the rule of the day was, you know, if your brother sinned against you once, you'd forgive them. If they sinned, you, sinned against you twice, maybe you'd forgive them, but there's no obligation. If they sinned against you a third time, you should just shut them out forever. So Peter heard that from his pharisaical teachings growing up and he said no I, I, I know this Jesus guy he's all about forgiveness I'm going to try to impress him to show him how smart that I am so I'm going to say se seven times this number of perfection but yet within that there is this assumption 
that actually there will come an end to when you have to forgive this person who sinned against you. Well, Jesus says something which no one expected. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. In in other words, a, a million, gazillion, billion. Infinity. There is no end to the forgiveness that we are to offer our brothers and sisters in Christ who sin against us. Now, as I said earlier, there's a reality to living in a church. There's a reality to living in this world. But I think when our Christian brothers and sisters sin against us, and yes, this can be be used in other formats at work and at home and at school and other places. It's a it's a wise thing. But the focus here is on our body, the church. I think that when our brothers and sisters in Christ sin against us the the most, it cuts the deepest. Over this past, well, since I've been in a ministry for almost 16 years now, the people that have wounded me the deepest are my brothers and sisters in Christ. The the people that have have failed to, to live up to what they promised have been my brothers and sisters in Christ. Those that have failed to protect me in ministry or support me in my walk in Christ have been brothers and sisters in Christ. And I hasten to add that I've never had to ask for forgiveness from anyone else more than my brothers and sisters in Christ because I've failed them and I've hurt them and I have lied to them And I have not supported them in their walk with Christ. Well, why is that? Well, I would argue that, as I said at the onset, we come into this body thinking that we're all shaped by by Christ and we should be. And so therefore we have Jesus level expectations of our brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ sitting in this room. We expect them to pour themselves out as Christ poured himself out. We have we expect them to um, to literally sacrifice their, their their very lives that we might flourish. We expect them to be humble instead of arrogant or proud or haughty. We expect them to think more highly of us than they do of themselves. And I would argue that the problem is not the expectation. Jesus Christ clearly says we must be like him. True followers look like him. To follow Christ is to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow him. It's to be a servant to all. And so I think the way that we solve the uh, the 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 hurt problem, the unforgiveness problem is not by lowering the standards or expectations that we have for each other. Because you see. What Jesus is doing here is he realizes how incredibly absurd what he just said is, is that there's no limit to the forgiveness that you give someone in in the church. Now, let me put put a caveat here because I do have to say this. Um, Forgiveness doesn't mean not distancing yourself, as as we'll see see later. Doesn't mean not distancing yourself from someone who, who is abusive or unwell or unstable. We'll touch on that later. But once again, the problem that we have in our culture, the problem that we have in our church, capital C C, C Church, is not rampant over forgiveness. Right? It's one strike and you're out. One strike and you're out. So... Jesus sensing the absurdity of what he just said and how his disciples are so confused over what's happening gives them this beautiful parable. And this is going to be the meat of, of, a, of a, what we talk about. There's a lot of unpacking of, of this, a lot of sort of cultural stuff we have to get into to understand what an amazing thing is happening in this, in this parable. Because Jesus is sensing his disciples are asking like we are now, how can we be the kind of person 
that puts no limit on our forgiveness of someone who hurts us. Jesus says this, therefore, the kingdom of heaven is compared to a king. Okay, this is like a king and, and you know, and he rules over a, a, not just one small part of, of his kingdom, but over the whole kingdom. And when he began to settle accounts with his servants, who are his servants? They're not the people that are sweeping up the palace. Okay, these are sort of his regional governors. And these regional governors are responsible for collecting taxes in their own areas. And whatever they fall short on, they have to pay out of their own pockets. And when he, when he began to settle with, um, with them, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Now, what in the world does that mean? Well, a talent, that much money is the equivalent to roughly six billion dollars in today's funds six billion dollars it was an enormous amount it was huge this was a this was multiple times what this annual king's budget would have been now you see what is implied here is that the way that this one um, servant built up this level of of tax debt for his area is that the king had forgiven him multiple years in a row. This was accrued. This was accumulated debt. This was, this was accumulated over time. And, and since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and his children and all that he had in payment to, to be made. That was the way business was done back then. You were sold into servitude, and a servant like this would, would, would fetch a great price because he could be used by another king as, as, a, as an administrator, if you will. But that's just the, that was the deal. That was fair. So, so, so the servant fell to his knees, imploring the king, have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. Now, is this servant living in reality? Absolutely not. He couldn't pay it for the past several years, but this guy's still in denial that I can get myself out of this if I just work harder, if I just press harder, because the way that you get in this level of debt is not by being frugal, it's, it's by being foolish. This is a foolish servant who has squandered the king's finances probably on his own luxurious living. But yet he's so blind to the, to, to the danger which he's in, he falls to his knees and doesn't ask for mercy. He just asks for a second chance to make it up. But that is impossible. Now here comes the hinge upon which this whole story changes. And out of pity for him, the Greek word there is splachnitsamai. It's the deep, it's the deepest possible compassion you could ever have for somebody else who's so lost in their foolishness, so lost in their sins. It's, it's the kind of love that I've experienced with parents of children who are addicts. Parents of children who, who are addicts. Here is this child. Here's this young adult. Here's this young person, maybe even an older per person, who's gotten themselves so deep into addiction that, that they've been pulled out of reality. It is overwhelming them, and they've harmed everybody in their world. They've robbed from loved ones. They've robbed from families. They've robbed from strangers. And the parent still looks at them. And their heart breaks over them. And despite all of their sin and all their failure, they want to embrace them and rescue them. That's the way that this king feels. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. Didn't lower his interest rate. Didn't send him to bankruptcy court and, you know, get to collect a couple cents on the dollar. Forgave the debt. Wrote it off. Now, for those of you that aren't familiar with the banking world, when a person cancels your debt, you no longer owe it. It's as if it never existed, but the debt doesn't go away. Why? Because somebody has to pay the debt. And who's that debt pay paid by? The person who it's owed. They eat it. 
They swallow it. So it's not a victimless crime. It comes at great expense to whom the debt was owed. And so you can imagine how this servant left feeling or at least should have felt. But then what happens next in our story? But when that same servant who was just forgiven six billion dollars went out, he found one of his fellow ser- servants, so one of his sort of under, underlords, if you will, who owed him a hundred denarii. That's the equivalent of twelve thousand dollars. I'm not a math guy, but six billion and twelve thousand are vastly different amounts, right? And this, but the servant that was just forgiven six billion dollars went up to to this one who, who who owed him twelve, and seizing him began to choke him, saying, "Pay what you owe." Now listen to what the fellow servant said. He fell on his knees and pleaded with him, "Have patience with me, and I will repay you." Where have we heard that same plea before? Right, just a little while ago. That's what. The, the first servant asked for the king, give me time, Lord. The exact same re- request. And here comes the shocking part. But he refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay all that debt. Now, what, what should have happened here? Well, of course, what's what's so egregious about this and why his fellow servants go and tell the king and complain about what what happened is that how in the world, how clueless is this first servant to the grace shown him that he would not look at this man? He was just forgiven six billion dollars. How could he not look at this person and say twelve thousand? That's nothing. I'll pay you 12. I I don't care. I've just just been forgiven $6 billion in debt. This is nothing. I've been shown grace upon grace. Let me show that grace to you as well. But of course, that's the point. And we see that our Lord Jesus Christ, or, or we see that the king upon hearing on this, realized that his mercy shown towards this servant was wasted. And he throws him in prison along with all of his family. Well, what does this have to do with forgiveness? Throughout the scriptures, money is often used as an analogy for our sin. And that's what Jesus wants to, us to see here. If you will, of course, who are, who are we in this story, right? Are we the king? Not even close. <laughs> Not even close. Our king is our heavenly father and his son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who has who we come to to him with a debt of sin of $6 billion. If there was a sort of a a chart or a calendar of each sin, right? They're all going to be worth the same. But remember, sin is not just what we do. It's what we don't do. Sin is when we think or when we want to do the wrong thing. When we desire to to, uh, do the wrong thing, we heard Jesus say, that's the same as doing it in God's eyes. So if there was sort of like a little, you know, counter over here, right, that was connected somehow to, to my brain, and it, and it would be constantly rolling up debt, right? Constantly rolling up spiritual debt to our Lord God. And so now the king has, now God has called us to account and to pay back that debt. Now we, in our foolishness, Number one, I've gotten ourselves there by squandering his blessings upon us, using them for our good, using them for our pleasure and not for serving the world, proclaiming the gospel and serving the vulnerable. So we failed. We're this servant that owes six billion dollars. Why? Because we're foolish enough to think that we could pay it back with our good works. So we fall to our knees. And this is no Lent is a time where we focus on our sinfulness. Not so we can work it off because, you see, we tend to think that, you know, my sin isn't all that bad. Or the little bit of sin that I do have, I can just work it off. I can go volunteer, can come to church on Sundays, I can, I can, I can volunteer, 
at the church. I can go work at a homeless shelter. I can give money to, to the food pantry. I can do all of these things, and somehow that will cut my debt back and make me even with God for the debt of my sins. We've made sin a very small thing. But you see, like this servant, what we don't fall on our knees and say is, Lord, have mercy on me. We say, I can pay you back. But out of great pity for us, as a child, as, as a parent looks at their child with addictions, he says, I forgive you. I forgive you. This debt is paid and it's paid forever. It's paid forever. Any further sin debt that you accrue will be wiped out as well. You are debt free. But of course, that comes at a cost. What is that cost? The cost of God's own son, Jesus Christ, for us. He takes on the debt in his body. He satisfies it. He clears it out. But at incredible cost to father and to son and to Holy Spirit. So what should that make us be? We should be the kind of people that walk out and say, all of you people that owe me debts of sin, you're forgiven. Because my debt to God is, was, was forgiven and your debt to, to me in comparison with that is incalculably small. Let me be liberal with my forgiveness as the Lord was liberal to me. But if, if you're like me, what do we do? Well, of course, he forgive me. I should be forgiven. I've tried my hardest. God knows my heart. God knows all the reasons why I didn't, was, wasn't perfect that, that day. I have excuses. And so we go see someone who sinned against us. And we grab them by the throat. And we hold that unforgiveness over them because how dare they treat me this way. They don't deserve mercy. They don't deserve grace because you don't mess with this. You don't hurt me in this way. And so grace for me, but law for you. At least that's, that's my heart. And over these past two, two years, I've seen the darkness of that and the bitterness of that in my own life as I have received God's forgiveness in spades, but yet refused to offer the same forgiveness to Christians that didn't see the world the way that I did or that didn't do what I expected them, them to, or said things to, to me that were truly unkind and unloving, but I was going to hold on to, to that and not let that go and make justice happen. Because you see, the problem is this. We get the amounts mixed up. The reason why we're not forgiving people is because we think that we only owe God $12,000 in sin debt but yet other people, when they sin against us, owe us six billion. Owe us six billion. But what if we reverse that? As our, as our Lord Jesus Christ shows us here. Brings us into reality that no matter how much somebody in this world hurts us, it is incalculable to, to the pain that we have caused our Savior. And it's a debt we could never repay. But praise be to our Lord Jesus Christ that he pays it for us. Because you see, the way we become for, for forgiving people is by focusing on this great debt. The, the uh, great English um, uh, 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 preacher, John Stott, used this example. Let's say I was to house sit for you, okay? I'm not saying I will, but let's say I was too, Okay. And you were gone for, 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 for like a week and a half on your great vacation to wherever you go. And you come home and I say, hey, listen, while you were gone, I paid that, that bill for you. I paid off that bill. Okay. Well, what, <coughs> what's going to determine your level of thankfulness towards me? But the price of that bill. So if it was, you know, your monthly pres pre uh, sub subscription to like Cat Fancy, right? Well, that was really nice. Glad you like cats too, right? Really nice. 
say, was, was your electric bill? And it's the summertime, and it's hot. Wow, Hamilton, that's really helpful. That was very, very generous. Thank you so much. What if it was your mortgage and your credit cards and your car payment and your student debt? And all that's just gone. You would fall down on your knees and worship. Overwhelmed by grace. Overwhelmed by grace. And that is how we have hearts that forgive 77 times. By focusing first and foremost on the fact that we have been forgiven an incalculable amount. Because we deserve it. Because we've earned it. Because we've we've tried our best. No, but because out of his great pity for us, mercy for us, splot nitsamai, compassion, it is his great joy to pay the debt, but it cost him everything. Because remember, on the cross, it wasn't just Jesus Christ who suffered. It was the father who suffered watching his son die. Painful. But yet his love for us is greater still. It almost applies itself, doesn't it? But I do want to focus on two applications. The first one is this, and the first one is targeted toward those who are members of, if not this church, a church, but people who who claim Christ as Lord and, and they follow Christ. And it's this. When your brother sins against you, Jesus says, when it happens, because it will happen. What you must do is you must approach them. You can't just let it linger. You can't just let it sit out there. You can't just sort of say, well, no big deal. I'm just going to ignore it and move on. I'm going to stay away from them. They're not in my tribe. They don't agree with me on certain things. I'm just going to stay away from from them. No, Jesus Christ does not give us that option. Look at 15 through 19, 15 through 20. These wonderful examples of this great framework by which we go to our brother who sinned against us and we tell them their fault. And if they repent, we've gained our brother back. But if they don't listen, do we just give up on them? Ah, I tried my best. I've done what I should should do. I've, I've fulfilled all righteousness. No. We now bring a friend back and show them what they've done. Why? Because we we, we want to hammer it into them. What's the goal? No, we want to be reconciled back to our brother or sister in Christ. And if if that doesn't happen, then we go to the whole church. And you ask the leadership to come alongside this person. Because when someone's sinning this deeply against us, we should care more about them and and the brokenness that they're experiencing that, that they might be rescued. But then there comes a point. Where we've said, you know, we love you and you're always welcome back. But because the sin seems to have a hold over you, we are distancing ourselves from you. Because we can't help you right now. But when you want to repent and you want to come back into this family, we will be overjoyed. So if you're a Christian and and someone has sinned against you, especially if that someone is wearing a collar. Love them enough to confront them. Love them enough to follow what Jesus Christ lays out here as the biblical way to be reconciled to your brother and sister in Christ. Can you imagine what a healthy church it would be if we out of love shared how we've sinned against each other? And we would receive that with grace and and a humility and not be surprised because we owe God six billion dollars worth of sin debt. So, of course, I've sinned against you and I'm sorry. I repent. How can I fix this? Unforgiveness in the church is not an option. Which is why Jesus Christ says this enigmatic thing here at the end. So if my heavenly father, so so will my heavenly father do to every one of you, which is sort of shove you out, if you will, if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. From your heart. This is not what, what this is not is works. This is not saying you're out of the kingdom and then you forgive your brother and then you're back in the kingdom. Right? That's not what he's saying. What Jesus is saying is that our ability to forgive those who sin against us 
is a diagnostic of how much we understand the Lord's forgiveness of us. Because you see, we can only forgive our brother from our heart. We can only seek forgiveness and reconciliation to those who have hurt us if we realize that God has sought reconciliation with us. And who are we to hold this from them? Who are we to not give away generously what we ourselves have have received at God's mercy? So brothers and sisters, if there is someone in this church body or in your church body at home or wherever it might be who has sinned against you, Go and tell them your fault. Go and tell them their fault. That you might be reconciled and that you might show them forgiveness. If you have hurt someone and you know it, go to them and say, I have sinned against you and I'm sorry. Do you forgive me? That's for us in in the church. But maybe for those of you who are visiting here, maybe you're hearing about this uh, debt of sin that that, uh, you owe God for the first time. Or maybe you've sensed it. Maybe you've sensed this sense that, man, I have failed God so much. Could he ever love me? Could he ever welcome me? The answer that this parable gives us is an unqualified yes. His greatest joy is to have you fall on your knees like we all have to and say, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. I can't repay this debt no matter how much time you give me. But in the weirdness of it, you promise your Jesus Christ, your, your, your son Jesus Christ as the payment for my sin. Can I be free of this debt of sin? And our heavenly father says, yes. And he pulls you up and he pulls you in and he makes you his own forever. And the debt will never be called in. So, who are we? We're people that owe God $6 billion of sin debt. But he's forgiven it. And now we can be dispensers of the same forgiveness that others might see the love of Jesus Christ. And this is good news for us sinners indeed. Amen.